it is my pleasure to welcome you to the session on differential privacy. Uh, today we have uh, three very exciting talks lined up that explore uh, the intersection of differential privacy with uh, information theory, with uh, formal verification, and with uh, programming languages. Uh, so first up, we have uh, Lan Chen Yu from Princeton University. Uh, Lan Chen uh, is a graduate student working with uh, Paul Cuff at the intersection of uh, information theory and its applications to uh, problems in privacy and problems in uh, detection and estimation theory. Uh, and today he will talk about a very interesting uh, uh, connection between differential privacy and mutual information. Okay, thank you, Pratik, and thank you, everyone, for coming. So today the topic is differential privacy as a mutual information constraint. This is based on work, work with my advisor, Professor Cuff, uh, at Princeton University. So the problem we consider is private data release. Suppose we have a database. It contains n entries. And well, we just call this database xn. Then if we zoom in and look at the database, if we look at the i entry, it's actually just a medical record of an individual. So her name is Alice. She's 68. She doesn't have cancer. And she didn't take treatment. So there are many people who are interested in this database. So for instance, we have Bob, who is a trustworthy data analyst. And he wants to know something like, is the treatment effective? And of course, we need an adversary. So let's suppose the adversary is Eve. And she wants to know something more vicious. So maybe she tries to figure out whether Alice has cancer or not. So maybe Alice is a presidential candidate, and Eve wants to attack Alice based on her health condition. But anyway, the goal of private, private data release is we try to figure out a mechanism M so that the mechanism output can provide sufficient information for Bob for his statistical inference while on the other hand, it should, pr uh, it should pr protect Eve from knowing too much individual information. Well, there, are, there may be many ways to do that. One naive way will be, OK, how about we just remove the first field in the database, then release the whole database. Well, in 2008, it's shown that this method is not sufficient. You have to sanitize the database, and you can like, combine it with some side information, and it's possible to recover the first field, which is the, the name. So we need more than that. And further, we need like, a privacy metric to tell us like, how this, this mechanism M works. And differential privacy is such a privacy, privacy metric. So in the definition of differential privacy, we need a notion of neighboring database. Suppose this is a database you saw on the last slide. And now we have another database we say two databases are neighboring if it, they only differ in one entry. So you can see the new database in its i entry is something like garbage. Well, differential privacy ensures that Alice has limited impact on the query output. In order to make this happen, differential privacy requires that the query output, given any, any database, this should be random. So indeed, this term, is, it's, a <coughs> it's a distribution rather than a constant. And further, it, it requires something more. Given any pair of neighboring data, databases, you need that this dis distribution should be close to the, another distribution. Well, here comes the question. What do I mean by two distributions to be close? Well, for the so-called epsilon differential privacy, it's something simple. So let's make a simple assumption here. Let's just assume that this, this distribution is a real continuous random variable. So the query output takes just a real value as its, takes real value as, as its value. Well, given one database, we have like a density. We can use density to represent a continuous distribution. And given another database, we have another density. Then for diff epsilon differential privacy, it requires that the two densities at any specific point, these two densities should be close to each other. In other words, the ratio should be outperbounded by e to the epsilon. 
So this is a formal definition of epsilon differential privacy. It, it's written down something different, but important point is just the probability, the ratio between probability is upper bounded by e to the epsilon. Okay, oops. And there is a re relaxed version of differential privacy, the so-called epsilon delta differential privacy. Well, the only difference is there is an additive constant delta there. An easy way to interpret that is, well, you only need an e to epsilon ratio constraint to hold with probability one minus delta. Well, even given the definition of differential privacy, you may still have many questions. So for instance, whom does differential privacy protect against? Differential privacy is just a constraint on the distributions. It doesn't directly answer these questions. So the second question, is, question may be, how does one interpret that cr critical parameter epsilon? And for the third question, what happens if the, the, uh, it's, if the entries in the database, it, it, they are correlated? So the goal of this talk is just this. We try to answer these questions from an information theoretic viewpoint. So let's try to think about the first question. So let's denote, the from now on, let's denote the output of the query as just a random variable y. And as, as I just mentioned, differential privacy requires that this distribution given one database is close to this distribution given another database. And these two databases are neighboring. Well, here we consider a strong adversary, the adversary who knows all but one entries in the, in the database. So we use this notation to represent all but the i entry in the database. Well, we can apply Bayes' rule, and here is the prior belief of the strong adversary about the last entry, the last entry he didn't know, and th this is his posterior. And this bound comes from the constraint of differ differential privacy, and it just tells us that the posterior update is small. Well, you, of course you can apply this base, uh, base rule to the weaker adversary. For example, someone who knows all but two entries in the database. And you can also, you can, if you apply Bayes rule, you'll get something similar, but you'll have like e to the two epsilon constant here. This e to the epsilon constant is the same in the definition of differential privacy. So in some sense, we can get the conclusion like differential privacy is intended to pr protect against the strong adversary. And its protection against the weaker adversary is more like the byproduct. Well, if I, if I rephrase the conclusion here, we can say something like this. The strong adversary who knows all about one entries in the database, he cannot learn about the last entry from the query output y by a lot. And in information theory, we have a certain quantity to quantify this thing learned. It's the so-called conditional mutual information. So this term here reads the conditional mutual information between xi and y given x, uh, x to the minus i. Well, we just say, we, okay, what I just did in the last slides is to translate the privacy guarantee of differential privacy into something called conditional mutual information. Well, why don't we just start from the very beginning, define a privacy metric using the conditional mutual information? That's exactly what, I, what we did in, the, in our work we just say a random mach randomized mechanism M is epsilon MIDP. MIDP stands for mutual information differential privacy if the conditional mutual information is always upper bounded by epsilon. The reason we like this definition is this definition makes it clear that we are just protecting against the strong adversary rather than somewhere else. Well, before I move on, I should really tell you, really tell you what like, conditional mutual information is. So first of all, I will talk about unconditional mutual information. Unconditional mutual information between two random variables, u and v, is defined as the, well, defines the difference between entropy and conditional entropy. So indeed, I have more terms to define, but anyway, 
what I want, to, want you to remember is the entropy of H of U measures the uncertainty of the outcome of U. So suppose U is whether or not Alice will win the election. If you don't know much about the election, it may be something like half and half. Well, the conditional entropy measures the uncertainty of U when you, you already know V. So if you check the result of a poll, if the poll tells you that Alice is leading by a large margin, then in this case, you will be pretty certain that Alice will win the election. But the poll, if the poll tells you something different, it tells you that Alice is far behind, then you are still certain that Alice will lose in the election. So in both of the, these cases, the conditional entropy is small. And we get something like the difference will be positive. And that's the mutual information. So in, in some sense, mutual information tells you the information about you contained in V. Well, so what's, what's the conditional mutual information? It's nothing but, OK, just the information about you contained in V when knowing random variable W. So the reason we try to use conditional mutual information is the following. This is the one, this is the term we use in our privacy definition, and it measures the privacy, the information leak to the strong adversary. Well, oops, for someone else, okay, we use this definition to define us just a subset of entries in the database, and this subset is indexed by this index set I. And this term belongs to someone who already knows a subset of entries in the database, and he wants to know another subset in the database. So this one, this conditional mutual information actually measures the information gain of this person. So now I will talk more about our privacy metric. First, I want to mention some previous claim using mutual information. So here I list two of them. You can see the first one is linear in epsilon. The second one is essentially quadratic in epsilon when epsilon is small enough. The previous claim using mutual information, actually they have some problems. They always consider the conditional mutual, uh, they always consider the unconditional mutual information rather than the conditional one. And they always consider the conditional mutual information between the query output and the whole database. Well, they miss a lot of opportunity to get something more interesting. So let me come back to our definition. This, uh, this is our definition. What I want to emphasize here is that MIDP is a property of the mechanism itself. It, we need, we, here we have a distribution on the databases, but we only need that to calculate the mutual information. Then we take the supremum over all distributions, and this, this supremum removes the dependency on the, uh, on the distribution of the databases. So in this case, as I just said, MIDP is a property of M itself, and just like differential privacy, differential privacy is another property of the mechanism itself. Okay, so the, the main result of our work is the following. We just try to compare the strengths of our MIDP with differential privacy. And it's actually, its strength is sandwiched between epsilon dp and epsilon delta dp. Okay, and further, if we have further constraint, for instance, if we assume that the privacy output only takes value in a finite set, then we can get the backward implication. We can get that epsilon delta dp is stronger than epsilon mi dp. So in this case, these two are actually equal in their strengths. Okay, this is the first implication. It's stated in the following theorem. But as you can see, an epsilon dp mechanism is epsilon prime MIDP with this constant. It has something linear and it has something quadratic. So with this theorem, it's already possible to recover all the previous claim I listed in the previous slide. 
And what I what I want to emphasize here is this theorem tells us an answer to the second question I just asked. The second question was, how should we in interpret the epsilon parameter in epsilon dp? Well, this theorem just tell us, tells us we can just interpret that epsilon as a conditional mutual information constraint. Well, just like our title says. And there are other two theorems. I won't talk about them here. If you are interested in the constants, you can check our paper for more details. Okay. Then I need to talk about something more interesting. Okay. It's hard to open. Anyway. I don't want to waste some time on that. So now I want to give you, I want to like interpret differential privacy from an information theoretic viewpoint. So let's see. This is exactly what the first, first implication tells us. And if so, differential privacy implies that the conditional mutual information is small. Well, here we try to answer the third question. The third question was, what happens if the entries in the database, they are correlated? Well, we want to know something like, what happens if there is a like, weaker adversary who knows less in advance but wants to know more? Well, the following theorem tells us something at least. Without any independence of assumption, this term, I guess you've seen this before, is, an, is someone who knows a subset and wants to know another subset. And the theorem tells us that the information he gains will be upper bounded by this quantity. So as we can see, if i is larger, then its complement will be smaller, and his information gain will be smaller. So this theorem essentially tells us is the following. The more you know in advance, the less you will learn from an epsilon dp query output. OK. So if you know something, one property in information theory, then this result is easy to interpret. The property is the so-called chain rule in chain rule of mutual information. Well, it's essentially the following. The information contained in Y about the whole database is just a fixed number. Well, if you, know, if you already know a lot, then you can learn just a tiny amount. But instead, if you don't know much in advance, then you have a lot of space to explore and you can learn more. That's it. Well, there are other properties of information theory, of mutual information, which will lead to inf in interesting properties of differential privacy. One of these properties is the following. So in general, the, the, the relationship between unconditional mutual information and conditional mutual information is not determined. So what you can learn about u from v when knowing w sometimes is smaller. This in the intuitive direction, it just says, well, if you know something in advance, you will learn less. But there is another direction which tells you, like, sometimes if you know something in advance, then it, it can actually help you to learn more later. This non-intuitive direction actually tells us the privacy guarantee of differential privacy when the, date, when the entries, they are independent. So in this case, actually, this is a term you see. You know, this is a bound we use in our privacy definition for the strong adversary. This is a term uh, from a weaker adversary who only know a subset, and he also wants to know the i entry. The, the corollary here tells you that actually in this case, when we assume that the entries are independent, the strong adversary is the one who knows the best, who, kn who learns the most from the query output. And since we have epsilon differential privacy, the, the information learned by the strong adversary is upper bounded by epsilon. So this corollary just tells us that the guarantee of, of epsilon differential privacy is desire when the data are independent. Well, that, that's just because any, any adversary cannot learn more than the strong adversary. And we have another direction. In this case, the conditional mutual information is smaller. It actually tells us that differential privacy protects against side information attack. 
So once again, this is someone who wants to know who know a subset, wants to know another subset. This is someone who knows a subset and knows some side information, and he wants to know another subset. This tells you that, well, if you have the side information Z in hand, well, you don't actually learn more. So in this case, okay, the corollary tells you that, well, you can now get additional information for an, from an epsilon, delta, uh, epsilon differential privacy output when you have some side information in hand. Uh, this last section, I will just mention some properties satisfied by our mutual information differential privacy. Well, maybe many of you are familiar with this. If you, like, the, the one of the most important properties satisfied by differential privacy is the composability. For differential privacy, it satisfies sequential composability with this constant, the sum of individual constants. And it satisfies parallel composability with this constant, which is the max over all individual constants. Well, what we can show is for our MIDP, it satisfies the sequential composability with the same constant. And it satisfies parallel composability also with the same constant in parallel composability of uh, differential privacy. So you can see these two definitions, these two privacy metrics, they are really very close to each other. And there are other properties I don't want to mention that, but once again, for epsilon, zero, epsilon differential privacy and epsilon delta differential privacy, they satisfy both properties. And for our MIDP, it still satisfies these properties. So in summary, I just mentioned the strong adversary assumption. Differential privacy is protecting against the strong adversary. This answers the first question. And I mentioned our MIDP and its strengths. This answers the second question. We should interpret the IPSO in differential privacy as a mutual information constraint. And I just talk about information theoretic guarantees of differential privacy. This talks about the second question. When you learn, oh, when you know more in advance, you can learn less from differential private outcome. And I mentioned several properties of M our MIDP, and it's very close to the property satisfied by epsilon, di epsilon differential privacy. That's it. We have uh, time for a few questions. Please come up to uh, the mic microphone and uh, state your name and affiliation, please. Maybe uh, I can begin with uh, with one while the audience is, is warming up for sure. questions. Uh, very, very exciting work. Uh, I'm wondering if you can comment on the implications of your new privacy definition, uh, more from an operational perspective in terms of uh, uh, designing practical mechanisms that achieve this new MIDP framework. Yeah, so our work actually just, uh, our work just now just try to figure out what we can learn from mutual information about differential privacy. So we don't have a sp specific algorithm to directly achieve our MIDP. So we can just say, okay, since Ipso, Ipsilon DP implies our Ipsilon MIDP. So any algorithm that achieves Ipsilon DP will achieve Ipsilon MIDP. But I mean, with, with um, mutual information constraint, you can get something interesting. So if you know, like, some, okay, if we have like a detection problem or like a classification problem, we can use mutual information. Well, we need to plug in something like the Fano's inequality to tell us that we can use the mutual information constraint to derive an error bound for the detection problem. And if we have an estimation problem, mutual information helps us through the so-called Fano's method. This helps us to get like a bound on the min-max error of the estimation problem. So there are maybe many works to do further. approach uh, with information theory. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, I think, at the JPC, there was this paper on semantic privacy where they also took this approach about 
not uh, restricting the probabilities, uh, the restricting how they differ, but looking at what you can learn from the output of the differential private output. Mm -hmm. And if you know the paper, can you maybe give an intuition how your approach is different from the semantic privacy approach? And if you don't, I would invite you to look at it and see uh, how, how you can show that they're different or how they're equivalent. And Oops, uh, actually I'm not aware of that paper. I know something, okay. I think he's from the information. Like Sherry, and, but I'm not sure who the authors are, but it was published last year in the JPC. Okay, maybe we can talk more about that later. I'll ask you a quick question before, uh, before we let you go. Uh, you found a number of uh, interesting connections between uh, mutual information and its uh, implications and differential privacy. Uh, which aspect did you find most, uh, most surprising in your work? Well, I feel like he's just like, the strength of our, of, our our, of our definition is almost the same as the strength of mutual information. As we can see, they have a lot of similarities, and there's like a tiny difference between them. Like, episode differential privacy is like strictly stronger than our definition. But really, that, that's really, um, I mean, surprised my advisor and me by a lot. It's like the speaker again.